Good afternoon. My name is Tathis, and I'm a biomedical engineer and an associate professor here at Case Western Reserve University. So today I'm going to talk to you about my lab's work on cancer nanotechnology and our quest for the ultimate drug smuggler. So before I begin, I have to make a confession. Before I became a biomedical engineer, I was actually trained as a chemical engineer in my undergraduate schooling. So when I look at all of you, I cannot help myself but see a collection of pipes, your blood vessels, and reactors, your cells, and that things have to flow from one part of your body to the next in a specific composition to react. Now, I would like us all in this context to imagine that for a moment we are shrinking ourselves down and we're going to become a nanoparticle. We're going to become 50 nanometers. And we are flowing in the bloodstream and what do we see? We see those donut-shaped big red blood cells and we're bouncing off them and we're actually about 100 times smaller than them. It's like a human, it's staring at a six-story building. But we're all flowing together. Cells, particles, and other things in the blood. Now, at the same time, we see in front of us those small molecules that are actually zigzagging at fast velocities. A small molecule now is about 100 times smaller than us, the nanoparticle. So it's like now the small molecule is looking at the six-story building. Now, a small molecule is moving not because of the flow so much, but primarily because of its random motion, which is also called Brownian motion. So as a nanotechnologist, when I look at small molecules, I call them little lunatics, because I have very little control over where they go. And this brings us, doesn't bring us to anything, this brings us to actual cancer drugs. Cancer drugs are lethal toxic molecules that have been selected based on their potency to kill cancer cells in a petri dish. So when we inject them into cancer patients, we try to achieve sufficient concentration and levels of the drug at the tumor site. And by doing that, we have to elevate the concentration of the drugs throughout the entire body, because again, we have very little control over where those molecules go. And this is the battle in oncology. Kill the tumor before you kill the patient. And that's where nanotechnology came and gave an answer, or tried to give an answer, to this important problem. And that was the early success story of nanomedicine, or nanomedicine 20 or so years ago. Nanoparticles exploit one of tumor's unique features, called angiogenesis. As tumors start growing, they outgrow the existing supply of nutrients and oxygen. So they quickly they start building their own blood vessels. And those blood vessels are very imperfect and immature. And they have big gaps, big holes on their vessel walls compared to the tight junctions that the walls of normal blood vessels have. So when we package a cancer drug into a nanoparticle, we, in we inject it into the bloodstream of a cancer patient, the nanoparticle cannot escape the normal blood vessels in healthy tissues, but very efficiently can start squeezing into those holes, into tumors, and delivering drugs into cancer, drug, into cancer cells. And this works very, very well for many types of cancer. Unfortunately, it does not work for some of the most lethal cancers. For example, brain tumors. We all know that brain tumors still remain a highly lethal disease. And there are quite a few reasons why brain tumors, uh, fail, today's therapies, fail to treat brain tumors. First, brain tumors, like glioblastoma multiform, exhibit a diffuse growth with infiltrating edges protruding into the normal tissue. This makes surgical cure nearly impossible. At the same time, at the same time, at the second time is that, the second problem is that the blood-brain barrier protects the brain from small molecules that circulate in the bloodstream to gain access into the brain normal tissue. And last is that brain tumors consist of cell subpopulations with actual great plasticity, uh, including cells 
that have stem-like properties that are highly resistant to chemotherapy and radiation. And these are, these are the cells that are responsible for the rapid recurrence of the disease. I apologize for this. Okay. So in order to tackle this serious clinical problem, we actually use nanoparticles as our building blocks. We have come up with an elegant way of taking any nanoparticle and giving it two phases in terms of chemical functionality, which now can be, can be used as fittings to start assembling one nanoparticle after the other. Kind of like a stack of Legos. So each nanoparticle can be of different function, can be of different type, while the overall shape of this nanochain particle gives it a unique ability to seek and target the sites of disease. More specifically, we will decorate the surface of this nanoparticle with small molecules called ligands that very specifically target biomarkers of the disease on the walls of the blood vessels in brain tumors. It's light. Rather than targeting the brain tumor cells themselves, which are actually sitting behind the blood-brain barrier and deep inside the tissue, we are actually directing the nanochain particle to go and park itself on the vessel walls of the disease. Compared to small molecules or spherical particles, the nanochain and its flexibility has a unique overall ability to scavenge for those biomarkers of the disease while it's circulating in the blood, and latch with great strength once it recognizes those biomarkers on the vessels in brain tumors. So in essence, we can generate well-distributed reservoirs of those drug-carrying nanoparticles throughout the entire tumor volume, in its primary site, in its infiltrating edges, and also in established distant invasive sites. However, the only thing we have achieved so far is that we have given lots of drug reservoirs throughout the tumor volume, but the drug has not escaped the nanoparticle to gain access into the tumor cells. And that's where the different components of the nanochain come into play. One of our most successful designs is actually made of three iron, iron nanoparticles and one lipid sac. The lipid sac can be loaded with different amounts of drug, and it can be loaded with different types of drug. The iron oxide particles are superparmagnetic. They are kind of, kind of like tiny little magnets, which they can respond to an alternating magnetic field. So using uh, off-the-shelf audio amplifiers and a low-power magnetic field, kind of like AM radio, those magnetic particles that make the nanochain, in their effort to align to this radio frequency field, they start vibrating. And this vibration quickly translates to a violent mechanical vibration that shakes the violently the lipid sac and bursts it on our command. And that liberates free drug, which can now do what they can do very well. The little lunatics now can spread throughout the entire tumor. So I will try to illustrate this. I will try to illustrate this with images of brain tissues using a microscope. In green, we can see the brain tumor. We can see its infiltrating edges. We can see the migration and the establishment of a new distant invasive site. Now, if we take a closer look, we can actually see that we have in red the blood vessels. We can see the cancer cells behind it. And in blue, we can see those nanochain particles that have docked themselves onto the vessel walls of those blood vessels in brain tumors. So under the influence of a mild radio frequency field, the drug actually escapes the nanocarriers and like a tsunami spreads throughout the entire tumor volume and gains access to each and every brain tumor cell. So, as new contemporary drugs are continuously becoming available, not only for 
uh, brain tumors, but also for neurodegenerative diseases of the central nervous system. We work very closely with neuroscientists and neuro-oncologists to make impactful nanomedicines and bring them to the clinic. Thank you.